the sin of indifference. Heavenly Father, we honor your word in this church. We honor you and we honor your word. You've honored your word above your name. We know it's truth alone that sets us free. There are no manifestations anywhere that can free our souls. There are no spiritual thrills that can set us free. It's the word, the word of the living God. Bring it forth, Lord, sanctified. Sanctify me wholly from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. Let there be the sanctifying influence of the Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, that life shall produce life. Oh, God, give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want you to open your Bible and go to the book of Haggai and leave it open on your lap, please. <clears throat> leave it open on your lap. And I'll tell you what, for the new believers, go to the last chapter, go to the end of the New Test of the Old Testament and go left two books. And you'll find Haggai between Zephaniah and Zechariah. Does that help? Haggai. We're going to be in the book of Haggai this morning. So just open your Bible and leave it on your lap, if you will, please. I still hear the rustling of the leaves. I'll wait until you get there. If you see somebody next to you struggle, don't try to help them. They'll find it. You have an index, by the way, you can look at the back of your Bible and get the number. Thank you, Jesus, for the word. <clears throat> now, in this uh, book, two chapters, <clears throat> this prophet speaking to a people who had spent 70 years in exile in Babylon. In Babylon, They'd spent 70 years weeping by the rivers of Babylon. And now God, by his spirit moving upon them and through the preaching of prophets, has excited them about going back to Jerusalem. They're back in Jerusalem now to rebuild the walls, the city, and the, and, and the country. They're rebuilding now. They're very excited. God is doing a great work among the people. There's zeal. There's excitement. The wall, the, the first thing, first uh, few months, they erected the altar and instituted a pure worship of Jehovah. They were surrounded by Samaritans who had a mixed religion of re, mixed uh, worship. A uh, mixture of heathenism and worship of the of true Jehovah. And now the pure worship of Jehovah has been established. <clears throat> now these people got a surprise when they went back. Because un under the Jewish uh, thinking that when you obey God, automatically you're blessed. They anticipated because they obeyed the Lord to go back to Jerusalem that they would find houses built. They would find vineyards, they would find fields and ready for harvest, and they would find friendly neighbors. Of course, what they found was a wall that was torn down, a city that was devastated. They found that there were no there, uh, there was no harvest. There, in fact, there was it bordered on famine, and they didn't have any friendly neighbors. In fact, their neighbors were so uh, set against them, they became incensed because they were refused when they offered to help rebuild the city and the walls. And so they write to King Cyrus, and they're able, through their influence, to stop the building of the tabernacle, or the temple, and the walls. And the people in verse 2, Haggai 1, 2, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Look at me, please. They're saying, uh, evidently, this is the will of God. God would not allow this to be stopped unless it was his will. And immediately the burden was gone. The zeal of God's house waned, stopped completely. Everything that had to do with the work of God, the eternal purpose of God was absolutely stopped. And there was a wild melee. They, they decided to go on now and build their own houses. They're running to the hills and bringing down cedar. They're building their beautiful cedar houses and painting them with wonderful ochre and red and uh, spending their time getting their businesses established, getting their homesteads and their farms and their cattle and their herds. God's house is completely forgotten now, totally indifference. 
Indifference means a loss of interest, a total loss of interest. They're no longer interested in the temple, the walls, even the altar of God. Now there's an obsession throughout all of Judah and Jerusalem now to do their own thing. Everybody's focused on making the dollar or, or, or making money. It's an amazing thing, verse 3 to 5. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now for thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Now what Haggai found now were people totally wrapped up in making a living, totally wrapped up in... Uh, and, and the essence, essence, essence of what they're saying, as soon as we get established, as soon as we get our work together, we get a hope for our family. Surely God is interested in our establishing our own families and providing for our own. As soon as we have our business established, as soon as we have our houses built, then we'll get back to the work of God. I remember a young minister who told me a number of years ago he was dropping out of the ministry to make a fortune. He said, I want to get rich, and then I won't be obligated to anybody. I'll be able to give a lot of money to the work of God, but first I'm going to go and establish my business. He went out and, and just gave himself to <clears throat> establishing a very profitable uh, oil business. And uh, as you know, when you have that as your goal, when you get the money, you forget what you said. And that I've seen that all through my lifetime. I've seen ministers. I, I think of a minister right now who was so poor, always house poor, poor as a, the proverbial church mouse. And he, he, he said, I can't live like this. He said, I'm going to I provide for my family first. My family comes first. And so he left the ministry and established a great uh, business in the Midwest. In fact, two years ago, I got word that he was building almost a city. He, he was building everything in sight and had wild, crazy dreams of a fortune being spent. In this past six months, he went bankrupt, and he's back now worse than he was before. He put money in, in a bag with holes in it, and that's what you're going to find in this. Verse 6, you have sold much and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe, you clothe you, but there's none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it in a bag with holes. Folks, listen to me, please. Here's the heart and the essence of my message this morning. When you become indifferent to the work of God, when God's house is no longer first, God's interest is no longer first, you're all wrapped up now in your business. You're all wrapped up in establishing your own way, in your house and your furniture and your cars and spending all your money and your time and your energy in trying to keep your own interest alive. Folks, God is not against us having nice homes. He's not against you having nice furniture. He's not against you driving a nice car. But he will not stand for being put aside. He will not take second place in our life or our business or our energies. He has, he demands, he literally demands, he has a reason for it. He demands the best of everything we have, of our time, our energy, our money, everything. He will not be slighted. And these people were slighting God. And they were using this uh, decree of Cyrus to back away from the eternal purposes of God. Beloved, when you gave your heart to Jesus Christ and you came, you said, I want to be a part of the body of Christ. The Lord heard that. You became a building stone in the new temple of God, the, the rebuilt house of David in these last days. And you are a living stone. You are a part of this building that he's building. And folks, when you, you decide that you have got, for some reason or other, you, you don't have time now. These people had no time for the house of God. They had no time for the work of God. They were all wrapped up, every, every dream, every desire, all their planning, all their scheming, all their, all their dreams, everything in their little house, their family. And now you see a people who are not satisfied with anything they do. 
They strive to make money and they put it in a bag that has holes in it. Now their money's not going very far. Some of them have more money than they've ever had and it doesn't go as far as it did when they had almost nothing. How many know what I'm talking about? How many have carried that bag around with holes in it? God's put something on my heart because there, I, I remember when I first came here to New York City in the first year when we were, we were, God was establishing this work, this church. I never saw such excitement in my life. There were people, businessmen, busy, busy businessmen, many career people from almost every kind of career in New York City, from Wall Street, United Nations, from all over the city. They came, God was doing a new thing, and there, there was such excitement. People would hear the message, go by the tape and listen to it two or three times during the week and never miss a service. Never miss a service. And I watched, it took maybe two, three, sometimes maybe four years, and I watched them little by little beginning to back away. And I know what was happening. First of all, they were no longer into the Word of God. They were depending on the sermons that we were preaching. They were not getting their soul fed in the secret closet. They were not seeking the face of God anymore. They were not on their bended knee, coming, having been fed by the Holy Spirit, and then coming to give something to the house of God. They were not praying they were not reading their Bibles anymore. And then they, not only did they neglect that, they became Sunday morning saints. Never saw them again during the rest of the week. And when I drop in on their business, they'd say, Pastor, I, I'm sorry, but this city is so demanding. My time is so stretched. And I, I, I think to myself, well, you were just as stretched. You were just as busy when we began. You had a heart for God. You used to sit at the edge of the seat. You could hardly wait for the word to be preached. But now something's happened. I can taste the indifference in them. I can see it when I'm in their presence. And I begin to watch. They, they, they would finally come Sunday morning and get that little touch of God. Just a touch. Many of them are no longer even going to church. They're not here. They're not in any church. They're not only lukewarm. They are cold. They're no longer in the house of God. Indifference is set in. He says, now that you become indifferent, and now that I am no longer the center of your life, the church is no longer the center of your social life. I believe with all my heart that the church of Jesus Christ, the brotherhood of saints, should be the center of everything in our lives. Of course, you know that I'm speaking of the body of Jesus Christ, he being the head and we being the body. He said, you eat, but you don't have enough now. You're never satisfied. There's something missing. You can't find any satisfaction at all. <clears throat> and he said, he that earneth wages, earneth it to put it into a bag with holes. And he's saying, from the time you lost your zeal for the Lord... And you begin spending your energy and your time on your own interest. He said, from that very moment, he said, God knows the time. It may have been slipping up on you slowly, but God, God remembers the time. And when God finally looks down in your heart and he says, now you have become indifferent. You become apathetic. You have an apathy toward me. You don't have an appetite for the things of God like you once had. He, he said, from that very time, listen to me, your money, your finances became very troubled. He said, it didn't go very far. You worked, you wanted your, you wanted the time, you had to make money, and when you made it, it just doesn't go very far. It's put into a bag with holes in it, it just goes like water. He that earneth wages earneth to put it into a bag with holes. Now, I told you that God wants us to, to give ourselves to hard, earnest work. God wants you to minister to your family. In fact, the scripture says, He that neglects his own household is worse than an infidel is denied the faith. 
Certainly God wants you to have time to do all these things. But he also said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And I find that people that put the house of God first, his ministry's eternal purposes first, I find they sweat far less than anybody else on the face of the earth. I wonder how many hearing this message this morning have been cooling off in your zeal for the things of God and the house of the Lord. I ask you to examine yourself this morning. Have you been cooling off? Are you just as excited about coming to church as you were even a year ago? Come on now. Are you just excited about hearing the word of God? Or do you get just a little peeved now when you hear a message like you're hearing now? Folks, I promise God I'd preach this in great love this morning, and I am. You're going to see and feel that love of Jesus through what I'm saying this morning. Are you so wrapped up now in, in, in just your things? Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. I'm talking now about coming to church. Church attendance. Listen to me. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner or the custom of some is. But exhorting one another... So much the more as you see the day approaching. The Lord said times are going to get difficult. The day of the Lord is coming near. If there was ever time for you to be faithful to the kingdom of God and the house of God, it's now. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Where are you Sunday night? You say, well, wait a minute, Brother Dave, the church is packed. I have to stand sometimes even on Sunday night or Tuesday night. That's not the point. You miss entirely what the Lord is saying. When you come and you become a part of the body of Jesus Christ, you give yourself to him. Listen to what the Bible says happens very, very clearly. You become fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And you're built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together growth to a holy temple in the Lord, in whom also ye are builded together for habitation of God through the Spirit. You are a living stone built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable God to God by Jesus Christ. Now listen to me, please. When Solomon built the temple... He sent an army of men into the, uh, to the, the uh, quarries. They not only cut the stones to size, they were all numbered. And they were brought to Jerusalem by another army of thousands of workers. And how they did it, I don't know. It had one of the great feats in history to bring those huge stones cut and numbered. Everyone was numbered. And they were built by number. They were built in space. Number four went here. Number five went here. Number seven, number eight, number nine. Every one of those huge stones were in place. They were numbered. They were cut out purposely to fit there. He said, you are fit in the body. You are a living stone. If one of those stones is missing, it mars the whole construction of the building. It mars it. It's not a complete building. You say, I, I, my attendance, folks, I'm not trying to build up the attendance. We have people standing. We have downstairs full. We're trying to seat the people. But that's to miss the whole thing. The whole thing, that what the Holy Spirit is saying in his word, is that when you join the body of Christ through faith, you become a part of what he's doing. All the ministries of the church, all of the fellowship of the church, I'm not talking about Times Square Church. I'm talking about the church of Jesus Christ. We being a part of it. But he said, if you, if you think that you're, God's going to let you just slip away and lay there on the ground, isolated by yourself, one stone. Well, I'm a stone. I'm a living stone. No, you have no life until you're placed. Until you are there in the structure. 
You are not a lone ranger. You're not out there by yourself because you make yourself open to all the attacks of the devil. They come at you from the right and to the left demon powers. No, you're there a part of the body of building, a beautiful building that he's building for the glory of Jesus Christ. God help you if you're home doing church night watching television. You're sitting there feeding your mind. Often we feed... The, 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 I'm not going to get on this very much. <laughs> Do you know why Pentecostal churches especially don't have Sunday night meetings anymore? In the early days of Pentecost Sunday night, you couldn't find a seat in most churches. They were packed. There was an excitement. That's, that was the great soul winning night. All through my boyhood, I couldn't wait for Sunday night because there was good singing, there was hand clapping, there was rejoicing and preaching on the coming of the Lord and people weeping and getting saved. I loved Sunday night and I still do. When I first came to New York and talked to pastors and burdened my heart about a church in Times Square, they said, well, one thing you can't do is have a Sunday night service because everybody's home watching television. That's the best TV night. I said, I don't care what anybody says. I don't care if it's a TV night. If God's going to raise up a remnant people that have the eternal purpose of Christ embedded in their heart, Sunday night will be a powerful night. And you see it when you come Sunday night. You see it here, a church that's full and people getting saved. I don't want to be a part of a church. I don't want to be a part of a church where the people's interests uh, are not wholly given to the Lord. I want to go with the people, a holy remnant, and say, Lord, I thank you for raising up this house. This is where I get my meat. I want to fit into the body of Jesus Christ, and I want that to be my first interest. Hallelujah. I want to come and meet Jesus. Of course he's first, but his work, you can't isolate him from his work and his house. Amen. Enough about television. <clears throat> God, God said in verse 10, Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon this land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of your hands. Look at me, please. I, I, I want to explain this the best I can. Ask the Holy Spirit to help me. He's saying, you wonder why things are going bad now? From bad to worse? You, we have people get up and testify. I said, boy, the devil's giving me a hard time. The devil's just harassing me. That's not what Haggai said in this passage. He says, the Lord said, I have called for a drought. He said, the Lord is withstanding your progress. The, the Lord is hindering your harvests. He said, and he is hindering all the labor of your hands. Everything you do, there's something blocking. You're not getting through. It's not working. And he said, stop and consider. From the time you became indifferent, from the time you laid down your trial, and, and, and you no longer had, my house was no longer your first interest. Now, your own interest your things, you're all wrapped up in that. He said, from that time on, I called for a drought. All these hindering forces in place, it would not, there's nothing to do with demons, nothing to do with hell, nothing to do with the devil. It was God at work. He said, stop and consider. You find this all through Haggai. Consider, consider, consider. Stop and think. Now, I've got to stop here and before some of you who are being tested by the Lord. And he's allowed uh, maybe a spiritual drought, a dryness. A lot of Christians, I know what that's, th what that's like to go through weeks of dryness where you, you wonder if, if you're ever going to have the moving of the Holy Ghost in your life again. I have 
gone through times of testing like that, such dryness, such emptiness, wondering if God would ever use me again, feeling absolutely empty, useless. Now, those are testing times. That has, that's not what we're talking about here. And I don't want you to get discouraged if you're going through that. Some of you are going through financial testing. He's, you're, God's trying to bring faith out of you. That's not what this is about. So don't try to put yourself into this picture. We're talking about indifference. We're talking about people now who are all wrapped up in their own things. They have no time for God. I'm not talking about people who still love Jesus with all their heart. I'm not talking about pastors and ministers who, who are just enraptured with the Lord, but they're, they're going through a very, very difficult time. That's something entirely different. And I would feel very uh, sad if you would try to think that I'm identifying you in this picture. We're talking now about a people who have lost interest in the things of God. They only want to come and get a touch. In fact, the prophet goes on in the next chapter and he, he says, I'm going to read it to you. It's in chapter 2 in verse 12. If one bear holy flesh from the skirt of his garment, and with his skirt he does touch bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat, shall it be holy? And the priest answered and said, no. Now look at me, please. This is a picture of a priest coming home from the sacrifice, and he has his portion. He probably has it wrapped in some kind of, of uh, a wrapper. And he puts it under his, armor, under his outer garment. And he has it there carrying it home. He said, Haggai I said, if, if that holy meat touches bread or wine or anything else, does that touch of that holy meat sanctify? Does it communicate holiness to anything it touches? And the priest said, no. And here's the dilemma of the children of Israel at the time. They had erected the altar. The altar was holy. And it's on the ground. And their thinking is, that's holy ground now. That means that it is communicated holiness to all the ground. That Why isn't the ground bringing forth fruit? Because we have a sanctified altar. That altar should communicate holiness to everything it touches. Now look at me, please. We're talking here, the prophet's talking about a casual attitude toward the things of God. A casual touch. Oh, folks, we have people, like in California, there's a, a whole group of churches now, and the whole thing is casual worship. They don't even have a form of service. You come in, and there are young ladies that serve you coffee and donuts during the service. And you are told not to wear a suit. You, you come with the most casual clothes that you have. You can come, you know, in... Short shorts and tank tops, whatever you want. And you put your feet up on the chair in front of you and you just relax. If there's a, if there's a sermon, there may be a sermon. If not, we'll talk. We'll just communicate. And, and a friend of mine, a, a acquaintance of mine was asked to minister in one of those song, one of those services and she was told before she ministered, don't mention the blood and don't mention sin. Cozy, casual atmosphere to try to bring them in slowly. This person was absolutely shocked at the casualness, and they were glorying in their casualness. Not even, not a word about sin or anything else. And folks, we have a whole casual attitude in America today toward the things of God. That's why our young people don't want anything to do with it. Their rock and roll is not casual, it's intense. Everything they do is intense. And they're going to come to the house of God for just a casual touch. A casual touch doesn't communicate holiness. You can't come and just get a touch Sunday morning. I believe that every time this church is open, every time, especially prayer meeting night, I believe that when this church is open, now, there's some of you have jobs, understand it. You don't quit your job to come. But what about the time alone with the Lord in the secret closet? What about this good book? Have you become casual to it? Have you thought, well, I'll, I'll do it when I get time. 
No, the Lord says, you will not put me aside like that. When you go to Malachi, you find the people uh, were so casual about the sacrifice. Rather than inspecting their herd and bringing the best of the flock, they would pick out any cripple sheep or lamb and just bring it casually to the altar. And God says, no. He says, you go try to offer that to the governor. You offer that to somebody, but you won't offer it to me. I want your best. It has gotten so quiet in this house. Our hope and trust is because the Holy Ghost is talking to all of us. Hallelujah. But he, he, he said from the time the, the time that you became indifferent, that's the time that I, I had to stretch forth my hand take away the joy, take away the satisfaction. I had to hinder your harvest, and I had to withstand you and everything your hands do. And he does that lovingly, that we may consider, that we may look at it. But you know something, folks? We're not like that. We're just like Israel. When things go wrong, we don't stop and consider and, and try to, to say, well, Lord, where did I go wrong? Am I indifferent? Am I apathetic toward the things of God? Do I have the zeal of the Lord I once had? We don't stop and examine our hearts anymore. We say, well, it's just one of those things. I'm going through a hard time. I'll make it through. This is just one of those difficult times. Listen, folks. God is asking us this morning to stop and consider and look at your life. Am I, as a child of God, as a living stone? Is his house, his work... The winning of lost souls. The ministry of the Lord. The ministry to Him. Is that everything in my life? Is that first? Is that my focus? I know what it's like to lose that focus. Years ago, as an evangelist, preaching to thousands. And I got so busy. Absolutely busy. I was mightily blessed and I was building a big house on 50 acres with an indoor swimming pool and playing around with antique cars and just losing my focus. Come to a place where I think I lost the focus completely. I could still preach because I had sermons that I'd learned to deliver. I tried to be as sincere as I could. I don't think I ever stood in a pulpit without being sincere. <clears throat> but I know what it's like. That's why I preached this with feeling this morning. I know what it's like to lose that focus. And when you lose that focus, the things of God become burdensome. They become a weariness. And it became a weariness. I traveled in in two big half-million-dollar buses, custom-made. And I traveled with a big truck full of hundreds of thousands of dollars worth, and I had a whole entourage. And they would go ahead of me, and I would go in here, and she knows. I, I said, oh, no, i got to hit the road again. And I, I would get on that bus and say, oh, no. And I was so tired and so weary of it all. Absolutely weary. That weariness, that tiredness came because I was not now praying as I should. I was not seeking God in this book just to find the reality of Christ. I was looking here just for sermons. Absolutely cold in heart. And I want to tell you, folks, the Lord during that time did something I will never forget. During that time, half my staff resigned. I couldn't understand one by one they were leaving. Our finances dried up. Sickness in our home. My son's Greg, Greg is here, and during that time, I got a call, head-on collision. God delivered him without a scratch. But I remember standing there. 
looking at that head-on collision and thinking of everything in my life and ministry going wrong. Everything was wrong. The anointing was gone. I've gone through the motions. Just gone through motions. I didn't know how to get out of it. Sick inside and weary and almost saying, God, I just, I can't go on. I don't want to preach anymore. I know what that's like. I've been to this point. This drought. This opposition from the hand of God. Every direction, east and west, north and south, everywhere. Everything wrong. When I stood by that accident, the Lord said, now will you listen to me? And I said, I'll listen. And I had to leave, I think two or three days later, another crusade. Still had weariness. Great prophet of God, Leonard Ravenhill, gave me a book. Christian in complete armor. It was 1,200 pages that thick. And I took it kindly, but I threw it in the back of my bus and said, Who, who's going to read 1,200 pages? I just thought I'll never look at it. But you know, we weren't 20 miles down the road, and the Holy Spirit said, go back in your suite back there and open that book and start reading it. And, and I tell you, it was the prophetic voice of God. Within a half an hour, I was laying on the floor of that bus, weeping and crying and confessing. The fear of God, the wonderful reverential fear of God came upon my life once again. I went to the rest of the fellows. I said, fellows, this is our last crusade. I said, I'm out of here. I said, I'm not going to go like this anymore. I'm not going to be a phony. I said, I've been miserable. The work of God is not. I've just been preaching by rote. I've been preaching by habit. God's blessed in spite of me. But I said, I can't go on like this. I'm going to take a year off and seek the face of God. And I canceled everything. And I shut myself in with God. And I thank God for that day. Or I wouldn't be standing here now. And God's interest from that day on. <clears throat> Beloved, from that day on, His interest... God, the. the I, I left all of that. I gave a bus to the singing group, and they went their way, and I sold the other bus, and I just began to seek the face of God. And from that day to this, His interest has always been first in my life. And uh, that's my prayer. God, don't ever, ever, and I have to pray diligently about it, because you see, we can't do it. We can't, when you get to that place, humanly, in your own strength, you cannot shake yourself from indifference. You cannot shake it off in your own strength and your own power. But what happened here in the book of Haggai, they listened to the prophet. They listened to the word of God. You see, God sent his word to me through this book, through prophet, a prophet of God. He sent the word to me, and I heard it, and I believed it, and I wanted to hear it. If you want to change, listen to me. There's a word here, and you have to get this before I close. God said, I smote you with blasting and with mildew and with hail in all the labors of your hands. Yet you turn not to me, saith the Lord. And you know what the prophet's saying? You, I, God, God's saying, look, I came to you with judgment. I came to you with blasting and mildew. I did everything to get your attention, and my judgment message didn't. Touch you. You didn't hear. Remember what Proverbs says? I called and called and you refused. You didn't want to hear my reproof. Now listen to me clearly before I close this message. I could stand here this morning and I could blast you with the word of God. There are scriptures here that I could just blast. I could talk to you about the mildew that's happening in your life. I could point a finger at you and say, the reason you're in this condition, the reason your finances are all messed up, and I could come down on this, and I could hit this hard, I could take the hammer of God, and I could preach judgment from this pulpit, and not one chain of apathy would be broken. God says, I blasted you. I tried to get you out of your indifference, but it didn't work. He comes now with the prophet Haggai and to an indifferent people 
to a people who were putting all of their time and energy in their own interest. He comes to them now and he says, I'm still with you. I'm still with you. And you know what that loving message did? And I hope it's what you hear from your pastor this morning. I'm not here to blast you. I'm not here to, to, to bring judgment message to you. But I want to tell you something. When I read in this book, when I read this, that a loving God trying to get the attention of his people says, <laughs> I called for a drought. I cut things off. I laid this on you. When I hear a loving God say that, then he says, stop and consider. I'm going to listen. And that's what I hope now that you will say, well, Brother Wilkson, that's me. And if that's you and you really want to change, you can't do it in your own strength. But the Lord comes with this message. I still love you. I'm still with you. I've not left you. My hand is still on you. I'm not going to lose you. And the Bible says that the fear of God came upon them and they started rebuilding again. And now Haggai comes, I think this is his third or fourth message that God's given him in these two chapters. And he comes finally. They've been about two months now back to rebuilding. The zeal of the Lord is back. It was not, they did not come through a judgment message. Oh, folks, I traveled all over the world for almost 15 years prophesying and preaching judgment. Thank God for those that were saved, but the church was hardly moved. It was hardly moved. Here in Times Square Church, we have preached the truth. We have not compromised. God helping me and examining my heart. I don't think once I've ever stood in this pulpit and compromised the word of God. When I've been told to preach strong, I've preached strong. Pastor Carter the same way, but it's always been bathed in love. And it's being bathed in love this morning. And if you're honest about it and say, well, Brother Wilkinson, I have been indifferent about my church attendance. I've been indifferent about my tithing. I've been indifferent about praying and seeking God and his word. I've become indifferent. I'm not where I was before. And I want to get back to that first love. I want God's work to be first from this day on in my life. There'll be no chastening from this pulpit. There'll be no threats. This the same message of the prophet Haggai. God says, I'm with you. If you will simply now allow me, the Holy Ghost comes now and the Bible says, and I, 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 I read this to you. Listen, listen to what God did. Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel and the spirit of Joshua and the high priest, the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did the work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. As soon as they accepted this message, examined their heart and returned, God says, now I'm going to stir up your heart. I'm going to move on you supernaturally. This becomes then the work of the Holy Spirit. If you sit under my preaching this morning... You say, Pastor, I believe you're preaching to me in love. And I want to take, I want to consider, like the prophet said, my own life now. And I want to come back to my first love. I want the things of God to be first in my life. I don't ever want to come to the place where he is second or I, I, I put him aside. Now, in closing, listen to this. Consider now, from this day and onward... This is chapter 2, verse 18. From the 4 and 20th day of the ninth month, even from the day that the foundation of the temple was laid, consider it. Is the seed yet in the barn? Yea, is yet the vine and the fig tree, the pomegranate, the olive tree, hath not brought forth. But from this day will I bless you. You know what the prophet's saying? And now I close. He said, you may not see the results yet. You don't see many changes yet in your life. You don't see your finances changing. You don't see a lot of changes. But he said, I promised you from the day you set your heart to seek me with all that's in you. That's the day I started blessing you. And now it's been sown. A harvest is going to come now. I'm going to bless you. Hallelujah. Folks. I believe that you, you can change everything in your life. 
by coming back to your first love this morning and making up your mind with the help of the Holy Ghost. Lord, I want you to keep my heart stirred. I want you to stand with me right now. Hallelujah. Love it, look this way. I'm not even going to pray right now. I want to pray later when you come. And ask the Holy Spirit right now to breathe on this congregation. I want every honest soul in this house this morning. Just bow your head for a moment. And I want you to do what Haggai the prophet said. Consider. Consider. Think about it. Do you have a sense that God's withstanding and holding back? That everywhere you turn, you see a hindrance? Then ask yourself, is it because I've let up? Is it because I'm not seeking the Lord with all my heart? If you have to acknowledge this morning that you've been drifting, That you've been a little haphazard about the house of God and the things of God. I want you to get out of your seat and come here and I'll repent. And say, Lord, I hear your word this morning. I don't ever, ever, Lord, want to have to have you withstand me because of my indifference or my apathy. I want my soul on fire. If you're backslidden... If you don't know the Lord, I want you to come with these that are coming. Up in the balcony, there are two stairs on either side. Go down those stairs and come down any aisle and meet us here, if you will. Heavenly Father, now convict us. Speak loveling to us. Let us hear what the Spirit has to say. Let us receive it, and Lord, change our hearts, I pray. As you have come forward... I thank God for his great love for his church, how God loves us. I'm convinced that I'm loved no matter what I'm going through. That love holds me. That love brings me through. Before I say a word, I want you to be convinced that God loves you, has a great love in his heart for you because he said, you draw nigh to me, I'll draw near to you. Your your wanting to come near to him brings him and attracts the Holy Spirit. He comes quickly to move upon you. Now look at me, please. I want you to know something here and hear it uh, deep in your spirit right now. He said he's more willing to give than you are to receive. I don't believe that God has complicated this thing at all. He's made it simple that um, a child, he said, could understand it. He's made it simple. And you come to me now and you confess. I not only cleanse you, but if you will trust me with your whole life, put everything you have in my hands. If you'll make a commitment to put everything having to do with the Lord first in your life, his work, his church, prayer, seeking his word. If you want that with all your heart, God said, you don't have the strength to follow through on that commitment, but I'll empower the Holy Spirit and I'll stir your heart. I know what that's like. I'll get busy and I'll feel a stirring in my heart. The Holy Spirit's Saying, David, break away, break away, get into the Word, get into the Word. The Holy Spirit keeps stirring. And when I haven't had time to pray, the Holy Ghost said, walk away, walk away. The stirring of the Holy Spirit. I thank God for that stirring. He'll do that for you. He doesn't do it just for preachers. He'll do it for all of God's people. He will stir your heart. Hallelujah. Thank God for that stirring. And then after He stirs you and you obey that voice of the Holy Spirit, He empowers you to follow through. Hallelujah. Thank God for the power of the Holy Ghost. We couldn't do anything without Him. I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Jesus, forgive me for my apathy, for my coldness, and my lukewarmness toward you and your house and your work. I ask forgiveness. Forgive my sins, my doubt, and my unbelief. I return to you now. I heard your word. I receive it. 
I admit, Lord, I've been indifferent. I've not put you first in my life. I'm sorry. I repent. Now touch my life. Stir my heart. Give me power to walk with you faithfully. I need your help, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I want you to lift your hands and just thank him right now for his faithfulness to you, Lord. I give you thanks. I give you praise. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy. Hallelujah. Up in the balcony, here in the main floor. You can put your hands down. If, you're, if you came this morning and you're not right with God, I know there's some of you that say, Pastor David, I'm not a Christian. I'm not, I'm not what you call saved. I'm not saved. There are many of you came because somebody invited you. And you're here now. You heard what I preached. Maybe you didn't understand it all. You, you, you said, well, that's for Christians. No, it's for you because the very fact that you don't serve Jesus at all, the fact that you don't walk with him, you've not surrendered your heart. That's proof that you're totally indifferent to him. You can't be indifferent to Jesus Christ and just walk your own way. The Lord wants you to come his way now. He brought you here. And the reason you feel that little turning inside, that's the stirring of the Holy Spirit. That's God. He's not, he's not saying, hey, get down here. I'm going to cast you into hell. I'm going to burn you. He said, no. God says, I've been with you all along. I've been calling you. And the reason you're here this morning, somebody invited you, and that, that was my work. I had somebody invite you. You're not here by accident. Nobody's in this church this morning by accident. Nobody. Would you bow your heads right now? I'm not even asking you to step out of your seat. I'm asking you to give your heart to Jesus right where you are. You can do that right now up on the balcony here on the main floor. Just even under your breath. You don't even have to say out loud. God hears whispers. God reads our thoughts. I want you to pray this in your spirit, in your mind. Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need you. I'm going to give you my heart right now. And Lord Jesus, I'm asking you to come right now and reveal yourself to me. I want to get rid of my sins and I want to be a free man, a free woman. I want my freedom before I walk out of this building. Now look at me, please. The Bible said, if you confess your sin with your mouth and believe in your heart, you shall be saved. You shall be saved. <laughs> Hallelujah. I tell you, if you meant that and did it this morning, you're going to tell somebody. You're probably going to tell the first, the first one you're going to tell is the person who brought you. And when you walk out of here and, and uh, you're with a friend, maybe uh, there's a sister here. You brought a, another lady. And uh, when you walk out, you'll say to your lady friend, I didn't understand anything there, but I felt something. You'll know that's the Holy Spirit. And then why don't you just ask him to explain a little further? Maybe they can do it better than I did this morning. Amen. How many believe the Lord is with you? I'm going to ask you another question. How many in this building, all around me, believe that God wants to bless his people? God wants to bless his people. Yes, he does. Keep your hands raised. Lord, I'm asking you to help us to become so given to you. And we claim this promise that Haggai gave to Israel. From this time on, mark it. The ninth day, the twentieth day, the ninth month. That was the time he said, put it on your calendar. I blessed you from the time that you set your heart to put me first. Lord, I pray that this be marked on the calendar for many. On this day, in the, in the month of May, whatever day it is. Thank you, Jesus. Blessing. Blessing. Hallelujah. Blessing. This is the conclusion of the message.